This whole village is another world inside a world. Homeless youth come to this area because this is what we know as safe zone. This is where we socialize, we make some mango. By the summer, I'm definitely going to be in house. I can feel it. The police make it seem like they're going to stop prostitution. And they're homeless, so they, you know, they turn into this lifestyle. Officer, you want to search me? They just don't like it. Ma, all I'm asking you to do is just see me. That's it. I don't know her as Krista. This is my nephew. What's wrong with taking this lifestyle and setting it outside your mother's door? I'm tired of doing that. We walk with our hands up. Hi everyone, it's Anthony Allen Ramos. All right, so the documentary Peer Kids explores the lives of Black, homeless, queer, and trans youth who call the Christopher Street Pier in New York City home and work to find their chosen families. After a very successful film festival run, the film is now having its broadcast premiere on PBS POV on Monday, August 2nd at 10 p.m. And it's also going to be available to stream on POV.org. I am so excited now to be chatting with the film's director, Elegance Bratton. Elegance, how are you? Really, really good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So thinking about this film, you know, it's been, you know, we're in 2021. I think, you know, you started filming, what, in 2011, so 10 years ago. Uh, you filmed for five years to 2016, then it came out in 2019. And here we are, 2021, and broadcast premiere on PBS, which is such a tremendous opportunity for people to see uh, this story. I mean, what does it mean to you to be getting this another wave of, you know, of, of peer kids for the world to see it? It's a real... Um joy for me because this film like you said i started in 2011 and through the grace of god and some incredible kickstarter supporters we were able to shoot almost 400 hours of footage and so when i raised all that money i thought you know by 20 i thought by 2013 though the world would be my oyster you know and i would have a lot of money thrown my way to finish the film and that did not happen you know and i met with a lot of uh all sorts of rejection and a lot of questioning about my intentions making the story and the value of the story, or well, really the value of the people on screen to tell the story. You know, this is all pre-pose, you know, pre my right. So, you know, it was, a lot, it was a lot to go into some rooms and say, I have a story that's about, you know, homeless, black, queer, and trans people. So to kind of fast forward, you know, with the support of Outfest and the support of, you know, the LGBTQ, community and the overall festival circuit to be on the precipice of the whole nation being able to see this film it just it means everything to me you know i was i was a peer kid myself i spent 10 years homeless so you know this film is a living testimony to you know the power of self transformation and the the film is proof that you know to anyone who's going through that homelessness to be specific that they'll be able to that it's possible for them to overcome it so it's a joy to be able to share that message with the world no and we're so happy that you did share this message you know thinking about what you said earlier uh some of the challenges that came up for you during the process what gave you the strength and the motivation to keep going because it could have been so easy for you just to say you know just to hang up town be like all right well i guess i'm not gonna be able to do this but what gave you that you know motivation and strength to keep going well, I mean, it's, I guess that's a twofold answer. I've got my incredible partner, uh, Chester Algernon Gordon. We've been together, we got together in the summer of 2014, which was the summer before I started grad film school. And um, at that point I had had a bunch of hours of footage and I showed them a 12 minute cut that I put in for, you know, a Sundance lab that I ultimately didn't get. And, um, you know, from that moment, all the way through to 2019 when I actually completed the film, Chester was the one who was, was motivating me and reminding me of the purpose and necessity of the work. And that was really helpful, you know, and and, and meaningful to me. Uh, on the other side of that, you know, I have my own determination. I, like I said, I spent a lot of time myself homeless. I joined the Marine Corps and, you know, Marines, it, ten tenacity is the one trait that I think every Marine 
comes out with. And, uh, you know, I was, I'd had a lot of tenacity going into the Marines, but after the Marines, you know, I had a, just a sense that like, if you show up every day and you have the right reasons for being there, eventually it'll turn in your favor. So, you know, the love of my life and the love I have within. <laughs> No, so and, and thinking about that, you have such an extraordinary story. I want to go back because you did talk about, I think it, you, when you were 16, you um, were kicked out of your house. You ended up being homeless or a peer kid you, uh, yourself, you said. So, you know, when, thinking back on that process for that five years that you filmed, having gone through that on your own, what was it like and how emotional was it for you to see you know, that these kids are going through some of the same things that you went through and then even, you know, more and have different stories. What was it like for you to kind of get back in there and and see, you know, that this problem is still happening? It was really healing for me um, because when you're going through it, you're so caught up in your own, per like when I was, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, when I was very young, I was so caught up in my own personal drama and sadness and rage over, you know, having my family reject me for something I couldn't help, that I, I really didn't get a chance to look around and talk to other people about what they were going through. And mm -hmm. to so you still feel kind of alone, like granted you're together. And when I started making Peer Kids, I, I realized, oh, right, all of us were going through some version of this, mm -hmm. you know? But um, at the time, I didn't, I didn't know that. I just kind of felt like it was just me. And uh, that was really, it really kind of put a, a cloud over my young adult life and made it really hard to love myself and to have self-esteem and to feel like I deserved good things in life, you know? So when I got into university and I saw, I went to Columbia, you know, and I saw how, you know, I was 30, in my early thirties going to college with kids who were like 18, you know, 17 years old. And I saw for these kids, like how much, home was a part of their college experience, you know, I felt very much alone again in that I didn't have that kind of relationship. I didn't have a family, a biological family waiting for me at home for, for my first semester, you know? So when I went to the pier and I found Crystal, Casper, Deshaun, and so many other people, it was really healing and comforting to be around people who'd been what I, who were going through what I'd been through. And for them kind of, I never really said out loud to myself prior to Peer Kids what actually happened. I just kind of lived it and kept moving forward just out of survival. So to have the people in my film, my participants share their stories with me, it gave voice to things that I had gone through that I didn't really know how to articulate. And that was really useful and helpful to me. You know, like, I guess the one scene in the movie, I don't know, spoiler alert, but at one point my lead character, Crystal, does go home and she confronts her mother, her biological mother, about the rejection she suffered because of her trans identity. Mm -hmm. And um, in the middle of filming that, I realized, oh my God, I've never had this conversation with my mom. I've never had the chance to go back and say, you know, well, what were you thinking? And why did you do that? And when I said this, I meant that. None of that ever happened for me. So I realized that this film was a way for me to have the conversations that I wasn't able to have in my house and in a much kind of more kind of larger political sense to fill in a gap that the, you know, the contemporary gay, gay rights movement has left in the normalization of our lifestyles and our identities. And that's dealing with working class people of color. You know, I, I did not have a film like Peer Kids growing up that I could show in my house to kind of express and to have the conversations that were so difficult to have in my home, you know, so that's why I'm so, it was so healing for me, you know, it was, it was very triggering, but triggering right. in the most positive um, and transformational sense. Well, I really, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that because, and you know, and I, have you been able to have any sort of resolution or progress with any of your biological family since, you know, <sighs> then? Unfortunately, no. Um, my mother was murdered um, about a year ago uh, by my sister and uh going to clean up the mess of all of that was the first time i'd been inside my mom's home uh for almost 20 years uh -huh. so um 
I mean, I'm in the midst, I've, I've reconnected with my father who wasn't really present for all of the this homelessness and stuff. But um, no, I have not. I think a huge part of what drives me as a creative, as an artist, as a queer artist is providing materials and, and, and work and entertainment that can help to help others not have to go through what I've gone through. So sorry to hear that. And, um, you know, thank you for also sharing that. Do you, have you been able to keep up with any of the people that you have featured in the documentary? Do you have any sense of how they're doing or what, what's happening in their world at all? Yeah, my, um, well, I'm really great friends with Crystal still. Right. And we speak probably like, well, now we're speaking a lot because of the yeah. film coming out and, you know, she's getting a lot of paid opportunities to speak for the film, which is nice to see and something I've always wanted for her. Um, Deshaun and I, you know, we're not speaking right now because he was mad at me for how long it took me to finish the film. I just going to grab my puppy, Lindsay Lohan, before she tears up my hotel. Uh. <laughs> yeah, her name is Lindsay Lohan. She's a really I saw that on Instagram. That's great. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, um, Deshaun and I are not speaking at the moment because ultimately he was upset with me for how long it took me to finish the film and we've never gotten the chance to come back and talk about it and I, I would love to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm still connected to the, I'm still a peer kid, you know, once a peer kid, always a peer kid, it's inside of me. So I'm very much involved in the, the ballroom scene and, you know, people from the peer are a part of my life. You know, even those who are not in the film that I'm, I'm friends with. What do you think the key is to improving? I don't want to say solving, but improving the situation of this disproportionate amount of LGBTQ kids who end up homeless and, you know, become a peer kid. And I mean, it's, you know, it's wonderful that they have a, a community, but there is such a problem with um, we are youth and homelessness. Well, you know, I'm one of those people that really, I'm really motivated and inspired by, you know, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, uh, two individuals that I see as kind of the mothers of the contemporary gay rights movement as it relates to me as a black gay man, you know. Um, and with that, you know, Marsha P. Johnson was 17 years old, homeless, black and trans. And she met a 12 year old, Sylvia Rivera, who was kicked out of her home. and Marsha chose Sylvia as her child, and Sylvia cho chose Marsha as her mother. And that love, that bond in the summer of 1969 was under threat through, you know, racist policing and profiling. And, you know, two trans women of color who had so much to gain and so little to lose from a revolution decided to start one. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, all of us who are queer and enjoy any form of civil rights in the Western Hemisphere, we are the children of Sylvia and Marsha. We are all peer kids. And I think that's the first step to making it better is that, you know, for a lot of gay people, queer people, the, the trauma of becoming yourself, when you get to a place of stability, you're so much, you, you spend so much, and I'm speaking from personal experience, you, know, you spend so much time trying to make up for what you didn't have when you were younger, that you kind of can become blind to the people who are going through what you had to go through to get to that place. So I think if we look at, you know, these homeless queer kids as our children, right? As our, as our siblings, as our family, that's the first step, right? They're not just some kid you step over on your way to go spend money in a nice, you know, wealthy gay area, right? These are, the legacy of a movement that gives you the ability to spend that money in the first place, you know, and I think in a much more kind of, again, kind of larger macro political sense, it's important that the gay rights movement prioritize homelessness as its cause, as its main agenda. Um, pretty much at this stage in the game, you know, we can serve in the military openly, we can get married, right? Um, HIV and AIDS, for the most part, is a lifelong chronic condition. It is no longer a death sentence, uh, provided you have decent health care, which is a whole nother bag of worms. However, I think that if you focus on homelessness, if you focus on those who look like and live the most like Sylvia and Marsha, a lot of those other issues will have to necessarily 
be kind of buttoned up because we're focusing on the thing that is most in crisis. You know, there's of the homeless people, young people in America, almost 60% of them are LGBTQ youth. Of them, almost half of them are LGBTQ youth of color. So, you know, I'm kind of at a point now with, I'm at a loss when I think of what is the contemporary gay rights movement if it's not dealing with queer youth homelessness. I don't know, I don't really understand what it is that's being done, with, you know, all the money that's been raised. Uh, you know, there's a lot of donations circulating around yet somehow we don't have centers for these kids to live in. We don't have scholarship funds for them to be educated. You know, we don't have a, a massive queer food drive for right. these kids. So, you know, first let's remember they're our family. And then once we remember that, let's get to doing what Sylvia, like Sylvia and Marcia did not do all of that just so that middle-class white men could get married. You know, they, they, she, they, they did that for all of those and especially for themselves and now that these middle class and upper class white men can get married i think it's time that they take their privilege and bring it back to the streets and solve this problem you know these are if we don't do it no one else will so well said and, and I, I feel that we are in an important moment to have these conversations and hopefully you know continue the change that has been happening just um with the world and with race and minorities, um, you know, thinking about this, you know, being available on PBS, it's so wonderful because I think there's such a great potential for people that really have no idea of what's happening when it comes to black, queer, homeless people, uh, homeless youth uh, specifically. What do you want, whether it's someone in the community, someone who's not a part of the community, someone that maybe just stumbles upon it on PBS, what's the message or what do you want them to take away from Peer Kids? Well, I kind of have two audiences in mind, in my head, you know, I've got for people like my mother who are going to kick their kids out, I want them to now have the stakes that are very clear as to what will ha could happen to their children when they do this and ask themselves a critical question if this is all worth it. You know, I wish a movie like this existed and I think maybe it could have had an impact in how, you know, my childhood went. So that's the first thing is like, and it's not just black people, you know, like this is queer youth, regardless of the color of their skin, are more likely, I think eight or nine times more likely to be homeless than anybody else in this country. So, you know, for all of these people in Idaho and Iowa, Kentucky, all the places this movie's gonna play, you know, be aware of what you're consigning your child to because you don't understand them. Maybe it might be better to take the time to understand them. Maybe the film can help you understand them so you don't make those decisions. At the same time though, I'm, you know, I'm a realist and I know that because it happened to me and it happened to Crystal and it happened to Casper and it happened to Deshaun, it can happen to others. And I want those kids who it's gonna happen to, to watch this and to know like, you know, you're beautiful, um, you're, you're worth living. We, we need you here, you know, you matter. Um, and that the life that you build for yourself is important that it's not you know, a second place prize. It's not something that is kind of, just because you've been casted away, doesn't mean that what the community that you find in that in that reality, that that, that community is, is worthless, right? It, 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 it's really a commentary on those who reject you. It's not about you, you know? Uh, Cause I wish someone had told me that when I was that age. So, you know, I really want these kids to know that they're gonna be okay. Like it's not, doesn't mean that you have to die. It does not mean that you have to have the, a horrible life or that you deserve to have a horrible life, that because you can find love and remake family, that means that you are loved and you do matter. And, you know, that's what I want people to pick up from the film. Well, it's always so good to chat with you. Thank you for all of that. And, uh, you know, I'm so excited. And just a reminder, everyone, that you can now watch Pure Kids. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, it will be available on PBS on Monday, August 2nd at 10 p.m. And then it's also going to be available to stream on POV.org. Uh, Elegance, congratulations on everything. Um, you know, so great. Ten years later, the the film is, <laughs> is out there for the world. I love that. And uh I know you're doing some other great things and I can't wait to chat with you about those soon. So uh, take care of yourself and uh, we'll talk really soon. Talk to you soon. Bye everybody.